The tour begins with a flight into Seoul, where we have two nights. The two hour flight leaving Seoul will skirt past North Korea to arrive in the great Russian city of Vladivostok. After a three night stay, we board our flight to the Kamchatka Peninsula. Seoul is a huge metropolis where modern skyscrapers and pop culture meet Buddhist temples and palaces like Gyeongbokgung, the first and largest of the royal palaces built in the 14th century. We time our arrival at the palace for the changing of the guards, a colourful tradition of the Korean royal court. This is performed two times a day and lasts 20 minutes. We also visit a district that exudes traditional charm. Insidong has been a market area for 500 years and even today transports the visitor back in time. Our two night stay in Seoul is in the busiest shopping district in the city, Myeongdong. It's full of life and boasts the best Korean barbecue in the country. Two minutes walk from our hotel, no visit to Korea would be complete without a barbecue. The next day is full of excitement as we leave the city towards North Korea and the demilitarized zone and into the joint security area. This is the JSA, the most heavily militarized zone in the world. This line is the 38th parallel and the white building behind is North Korea. Both are photographing each other and take turns to host tourists. The blue hut in the middle is the MAX conference room where administration talks of the JSA are held. One part of this table is in North Korea and the other is in the south. The entrance to the north is guarded. While still remaining in the DMZ, we visit an observation point that overlooks the North Korean Peace Village. Built in 1953, the North Koreans assert that 200 people live here, but the South contend that it's a ghost town that blasts propaganda via loudspeakers. The flagpoles of both countries can be seen clearly. South Korea stands at 100 meters, while the North's is 160, the fourth highest in the world today. Before we return to the city, we visit the Dorasan train station, symbol of hope for reunification. Tracks were laid linking Seoul to Pyongyang in 2002, but the shiny new terminal is yet to be used. The next morning, we depart from Incheon Airport for our two hour flight to Vladivostok. The journey time from the airport to Vladivostok city is 30 minutes and we meet Ksenia who has been our guide since the tour began. Hi there travel directors, my name is Ksenia and I'm from Vladivostok. Vladivostok is the fusion of eastern and western cultures perfectly located on the coast of the Sea of Japan. I cannot wait to show you my hometown. One of the icon images of Vladivostok is the railway station. 
which was opened up in 1893. It is a terminus of the 9,198km Trans-Siberian journey. The train will travel through seven time zones and will take one week to reach Moscow. One famous resident of Vladivostok was Yul Brynner, who was born here in 1920. He lived in this house until he was four years old before his mother moved to Harbin, China and eventually to America. On our first evening in Vladivostok, we enjoyed dinner at the vantage point of the Eagle's Nest for stupendous views across the Golden Horn Bay. Up until 1992, Vladivostok, home to Russia's navy, the mighty Pacific Fleet, was virtually a sealed military fortress. Today it is open, sophisticated and beautifully restored with billions of rubles. Exploring the city unveils many poignant reminders of the war in the Far East. One of these monuments, now a museum, is a legendary S-56 submarine. She won many battles and was declared dead 19 times, only to return. By the 19th time, she was thought to be invincible. Just outside the submarine is the eternal flame and the names of thousands who fought for their country etched into the wall. In the afternoon, we take a boat trip out onto the Golden Horn Bay and beyond. The cruise gives us a good understanding of Vladivostok's relationship with the sea and the forest nature. Vladivostok, which means Master of the East, is often thought to be the sister of San Francisco. No longer encumbered by Soviet infrastructure, it is a city of striking architecture, sandy beaches and curious and friendly people. When we arrive at Kamchatka, we will have one night in the capital, Petropavlovsk. The next day, we take a bus to Esso, right in the centre of the peninsula. After two nights here, we board our helicopter to Lake Duvayat Toshnaya for two days of bear watching. We return to Esso for a further two nights, and from here we go back to Petropavlovsk for three nights, during which we take another helicopter flight to the Valley of the Geysers. Imperial 7 Alpha 73 Diego to Petropavlovsk Kamchatsky approach. 2 km southwest. Flight level 10000 inbound to runway 34 left. On a clear day at Elizabeth Airport, Kamchatka, we will be greeted by the surreal sight of volcanoes surrounding the airfield. The first of many astonishing experiences on the Kamchatka Peninsula. It's a beautiful summer's evening in Petropavlovsk. We are greeted by the volcanoes of Koyatsky, Avishinsky and Kozelsky. It's a vista that's hard to believe. And we are also greeted by Allah, who will be our guide throughout Kamchatka. Hello, I'm Allah. I'm your guide in Kamchatka. I adore Kamchatka and I invite you to be our guests here in the beautiful land of volcanoes and the Pacific. Welcome. The next day we leave Petropavlovsk and travel on good roads 
for nearly 600 kilometers to the very center of Kamchatka. We reach our destination by mid-afternoon. Esso is a beautiful alpine village that lies in the caldera where two rivers meet. During our time in the village, we stay in a lovely family-run hotel with true Russian hospitality. The hotel also has a superb thermal swimming pool where travel directors host a barbecue for the evening. We walk through Esso to begin today's adventure on the Bistria River. Waterproof boots, clothes and life vests are supplied and the captains give us a small briefing before we set sail. The Bistria River is a tributary of the mighty Kamchatka River. There are no technical points for this section of the river. Rather, it is more of an immense tranquil experience in probably the most unspoilt nature in the world. We stop for a tasty salmon lunch on one of the islands of the Bistria and shortly afterwards we board our bus for the 20 kilometer journey back to Essen. The next morning we visit a group of indigenous people called the Evans. They live near Esso and were traditionally nomads. Today they are mainly sedentary, but they still continue their traditions, including reindeer herding. It's a fascinating visit and we have lunch with the Even elders before returning to Esso. leave Esso and take a 40 minute flight by MI8 helicopter across incredible landscape to our bear camp for two nights. The camp sits beside Lake Divya Toshnaya. There are no roads in, only electricity from our generator and only sat phones for communication with the outside world. This is the very essence of pristine beauty. After a relaxing lunch and in the late afternoon, we begin our first adventure with the bears. This is our tour leader, Anna. She can hardly contain her nervous excitement. We have built a non-intrusive observation deck that allows us to observe the bears at a confluence of two rivers. After our first bear viewing in the evening, we return for dinner. The cuisine here is typically home-cooked Russian food. It's very tasty and varied throughout. And it's all thanks to our super chef Natasha, who has been with us for many years. The camp itself consists of log cabins. It's basic, but very well run, with wonderful staff, and it even has its own thermal bar. The best time to observe the bears are before breakfast, 
and before dinner. A gun master always accompanies us during the bear viewing. Unlike the grizzly, the Kamchatka bear is not aggressive, and this is the reason why. Sockeye salmon, the largest bear feast in the world. The bear will eat up to 40 salmon a day, and this intake is responsible for the pinkish hue of the coat. A large male Kamchatka bear will weigh up to 500 kilos and stand at 3 meters. Their power is irresistible. With one bear to every 30 inhabitants, Kamchatka is the world's last and largest natural sanctuary. After two days at the camp, we return to Esso for two nights. We then head onwards to Petropavlovsk for the final three nights. On our first full day in Petropavlovsk, we board a boat for six hours to explore one of the biggest and most beautiful stretches of water in the world, Abacha Bay, gateway to the Pacific. These are the three brothers, they form an entrance to Abacha Bay. The marine and bird life here is astounding. And if we are lucky, we may get to see orcas as well. <laughs> On our last day in Kamchatka, we depart for the Valley of the Gizas by MI-8 helicopter. There will be three takeoffs and landings and we will circle two active volcanoes. The Valley of the Gizas was discovered only in 1941. The area is six square kilometers and has over 50 active geysers and dozens of mud pools. It is the most compact geyser field in the world. We reboard our helicopter for 20 minutes until we reach the Uzon caldera. Formed 40,000 years ago, it is the biggest geothermal area in Kamchatka. The area is an unimaginable 9 by 12 kilometers. The colored waters and the sulfur fumes is like a scene from the book of Genesis. The penultimate helicopter flight whisks us into the stunning Nalachevsky cordon for a lunch surrounded by wildflowers. It resembles a set from The Sound of Music. Kamchatka is essentially an island, all but cut off from mainland Russia, 11 time zones away from Kaliningrad. This is where the power of nature is irresistible. It is where the earth smiles, cries, and where she becomes furious. A tour de force of nature.